Yeah, sure. My name is John Keg. I'm uh, the Donahue Professor of the Arts at UMass Lowell. Um, I teach at outlier.org, um, and I have written a number of trade books on philosophy and memoir, Hiking with Nietzsche, American Philosophy Love Story, um, and Six Souls Healthy Minds, How William James Can Save Your Life. Um, I write pretty regularly for the book review at the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal, and um, write essays uh, for uh, general readership. Okay, so I guess the, the first question is, so I, I am not someone who has a background in philosophy. Like I said, I majored in supply chain management, um, but I'm interested in philosophy for its usefulness and insights in a practical sense. And of course, pragmatism seems like, you know, one of the most practical and pragmatic philosophies. Could you just explain kind of pragmatism to a layman, someone who has no background in philosophy? You know, what, what is the essential gist of, of pragmatism and its implications? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, I'll give the stereotype of it, and then we'll dig down a little bit and get a more full picture. So pragmatism uh, arose in the um, 1870s, 1880s, uh, in the works of William James and C.S. Peirce, um, and then later with John Dewey, and Jane Addams. The, the tie between these four thinkers is they all, to a greater or lesser degree, believe that um, truth and meaning um, is tied inextricably to the way that it works in the world. So pragmatic maxim, truth should be judged on the basis of its practical consequences. Um, there can be a lot of um, sort of arguments that aren't real arguments because we don't actually touch down into like the practical differences between these views. And right. if there's no practical difference between any particular views, then there's really not an argument to be had. So that's, uh, so, you know, the most crass way of understanding pragmatism is something like truth is what works. Okay. Right. And then, then we can figure out like what that means. And Go ahead. I know there's a, I think there's like a metaphor that I heard where it's William James described like a person circling, I think it was a squirrel around a tree versus uh, a squirrel circling the person. Can you explain just that, that simple metaphor? Sure. I mean, like the question is, are you going around the squirrel or is the squirrel going around? And there's really no practical difference. I mean, James is also pointing out at that particular, with that particular uh, metaphor that we pick really stupid things to argue about right. yes um but so there, there's no practical difference between those two views that's the point that james is making right. um he's also he's also gesturing at that point he's out in the woods with a bunch of friends sort of on a holiday trip and um james is always concerned about william james was always concerned about the way that philosophers can kind of like get in their own little echo chamber yes. slash silos sure. and not actually hook into anything other than a little intellectual holiday excursion. Right. And so James is pushing us to be thinkers in the real world um, and to be thoughtful um, with the business of living. So, so that's, that's one. So pragmatism is what works. What I also think is really important is that pragmatism goes back to the ancients and the ancients thought that, the, that philosophy was um, was about the thoughtful business of living and figuring out what makes life worth living um, and is life worth living. That's like a central question to the ancients, but and then um, then also to the pragmatists that inherit this tradition in the nineteenth century. Right, and so you know now, I, like I think about like Ayn Rand objectivists or Sam Harris, you know, the moral realist type character, or on the other side, sort of the postmodernists, you know, claim no objective truth or no, no, no uh, grand narratives. How does, I guess, what are, what are your thoughts on, on, on either end of that spectrum? The, the moral sure. realist, how does that contrast to pragmatism? And then how does postmodernism or, you know, sure. uh, deconstruction, I guess? So, I mean, pragmatism is a mid-range um, is a mid is a mid world theory, okay? It doesn't claim that we are completely divorced from uh, the chances of achieving the truth. Nor does it say that we have the truth already, okay? And so, uh, 
pragmatism is a process, okay? Um, we could call it the Socratic method, where you sort of question and answer to lead to deeper insight, right? right? Or you can think about it as um, the scientific method, where you pose hypotheses and then test these hypotheses and try to, you know, asymptotically approach the truth, yeah. okay? Make some progress here. And um, progress is always, then the question will be, what, well, what would count as progress? And then the 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 pragmatist is always going to respond. James says it's about amelioration by, in other words, making something better. Sure. Okay. And then the question obviously is better for whom and better for what. And then James talks about that. Right. But never does, we never go with the full relativist position where we say like, there is no such thing as truth. All, all claims are equally truth, um, you know, opposite or, um, truthy right. and then then there's so the pragmatist isn't going to go that direction okay but nor is the pragmatist going to say that there's something like a one-to-one -one correspondence between the claims that we make about the world and some sort of real out there okay sure. Sure. So like we can approximate yes um, and and sorry one, one last thing mm -hmm. like the the truth that we have are interpretations of reality and um, you can have better or worse interpretations on the basis of certain forms of justification and how they function in our lives. And I think that's very helpful for us because it allows, it allows us to have conversations about the interpretations that we have. And we marshal evidence on the basis of those interpretations that, that do or do not fit together for our interlocutors. And we have, I mean, that's how... That's how philosophical discussions happen, right? Rather than just screaming matches, right? And and that, and it seems to me that's how like, you know, everyday people act. It's you know, it's it's not this disembodied thoughts. We're going to just purely evaluate things on rationality and logic only. It's like, well, what it? We we need to be talking and having a conversation for a reason. We're discussing something for a reason, and presumably we both you know are on the same page in that. So so would you? I mean, would you describe? Is it fair to say pragmatism is utilitarian in its approach? Or is or is fundamentally utilitarian, or what's what are the dis, what are the distinctions? No, I, I mean, um, so yeah, sure. So utilitarianism. Um, so if you take it as a strict uh, school of philosophy, um, you know, arises about a hundred years before James is working, and utilitarianism says the greatest good for the greatest number, right? Um, and each each counts for one and no more than one, and we can use a utilitarian calculus to figure out what is the right thing to do. Sure. Okay, and I think that there are there are certain really um, important differences because James and his intellectual godfather Emerson believed that the individual was really important, and so it's not satisfactory for James, like a utilitarian, to simply say like, well let's sacrifice the individual for the you know greater good right. of the group like that, right. that that's like eh, no yes because it also also says things like well let's subjugate the minority for the sake of the majority right um and james is like eh, no so too with emerson and thoreau um yeah. so yeah i'd say they're interested in talking i mean what is um utilitarian about it is that they say that um happiness matter. I mean, a pragmatist would say happiness matters. And now we have to figure out what happiness means for different individuals. Sure. Or like well-being is, would be Sam Harris's yeah. word, right? Yeah. You got it. So then the question is always well-being for whom? Yes, exactly. Okay. Is it, is it just my well-being? I and Randstad? Right. Or is it the well-being of, you know, the, the greater good or something like that? So. Right. So how, so I guess, how does he, cause I think earlier you mentioned, you know, James is concerned is the amelioration, making something better. So it, does he have a sort of an axiomatic perspective on how you go about that calculation? Or is it kind of like it's whatever people decide or talk about in the moment? That's or good. I mean, it, there's um, there, there are different answers within the pragmatic canon. OK, so James would probably be more individualistic in the answer than somebody like Peirce. Uh, Peirce is a good old scientist. I, I tend to go the Peirce, Peirce direction on okay. this one, where 
if amelioration means making things better, we need to get a community, you know, what his friend Josiah Royce would call a community of interpretation together. Sure. Okay, and we want the widest possible community of interpretation, right, looking at this problem. And then we talk it out. Like we, we give justifications, we we examine the consequences of particular beliefs and actions, long lasting consequences and immediate consequences. And we measure those as a group. Right. And we try to come to some sort of clear interpretation about the real world or the question at hand. And, and it should be a better interpretation than the one that we had in the past. Sure. Right. It should lead to richer. Con it should lead to. Um, more well-being for more individuals or um and individuals there's an open question what do we mean just you know human persons or do we mean non-human persons yeah, yeah. too like but, animal, like but, yeah being against animal cruelty or something like that but the main thing is is that we do we have an interpret you know a community of interpretation talking these things out in a pragmatic fashion and if they it, so there's not an axiom about like what counts as well-being and what doesn't count as well-being but what is axiomatic for the pragmatist is the process okay sure. the process is hypothesis formation sharing that hypothesis with others testing that hypothesis in honest ways being honest about being genuine and authentic about uh, what consequences are going to um, be caused by this particular belief and then the actions based on that belief th that's axiomatic for pragmatists right. is the process so and this is just my you know, ignorance of philosophy and the different categories or the different scales to which um, it can encompass things. But like, you know, in a, in a super broad sense, you know, I, I, could, I could see like Christianity, you could say, is an all encompassing philosophy because it offers prescriptions about morality and kind of the final nature of reality and whatnot. Um, so is it so so like pragmatism on its own? Does it because you, you were just talking, you know, it's, it's about the process, but the sort of the axioms underneath it, what does well-being mean and all that, it, it doesn't necessarily offer prescription, so, it, or at least that's my understanding of it. So does pragmatism have to be merged with a different Something philosophy? Else. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good question. It's a really nice question. And James, James says that we should think about pragmatism as a hallway that allow, allows us to move between different disciplines and, and gives us some sort of um, procedure within particular disciplines. That's a nice way to start. Sure. I think, however, that James does say that there are certain guide, certain certain things um, that we need to hold on as individuals in order to make our lives meaningful. Okay, is he? It's not wish. It's not just oh, it's just a process. Mm -hmm. The process matters because it it uh, indicates certain commitments. A commitment to giving an apologia or an or an account of your life before you die okay james was all about that james was like can i say that my life is worth living like he was very interested and that's like an ancient it's it's an ancient idea that like the point of living is to be able to get to the end of your life and then say something about your life so that it's not a complete waste of time sure like that's that's a, that's that's a, a good that's a good goal that's a, and that's hard for right. human beings, sure. right? Because we can fuck up and also, excuse my language, no, we can fuck up in all sorts of ways. So I mean, and um, the, so that's one commitment where we say, okay, there's this apologia issue, okay? The other issue is a type of epistemic humility issue that you have to stick to. Like, you know that you know nothing, Socratic wisdom. James also is like, you know, you have to exercise a little bit of epistemic humility about the truth claims that you put forward, okay? That's another commitment of pragmatism. So first first commitment of pragmatism, get your apologia or the account of your life together. Try to figure out what that means. Second thing, have some epistemic humility. Okay, that's clear. Third, realize that there are other people out there whose lives are as vivid as your own. That's what James calls a certain blindness in human beings is our lack of ability to see that others' lives have meaning for them in a way that ours do as well and so and sure. and, and so like there's when when you say like what's pragmatism well i can give you different you know i can give you different strands of pragmatism that all hang together but you can probably hear like i'm evading sure. um 
I'm a, I'm evading just taking and being like, this is the definition. Right. Well, because, that's the epistemic humility, right? To say, yeah. no, this is what it is. That da, 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 would be at odds with yeah. that, right? And there are strands that come through to me that are, I mean, really important to my life, like the three that I just named. Right. Um, well, so, so I, I wanted to ask you about, because, you know, one of the things that... Like when I am evaluating the merits of a, like a philosophical idea or, you know, a social scientific theory, something outside yeah. of the realm of like mathematics or hard science, it, like it's, it's useful or, or it's just how I approach things. It's important for me to evaluate sort of the, the person's relationship to the philosophy they're putting forward, right? So like a mathematician, you know, he can be a terrible person or a good person or whoever he is, but as he, you know, the facts are the facts. So he can just say, you know, you can listen to one map petition and it's the same for everyone else. But for philosophical yeah. ideas, they're, they're much more varied. And I've heard, I definitely believe that certain philosophies appeal to certain personalities and certain personality, you know, we, we differ, people differ in personality, you know, indisputably that's, it's measurable, right? With personality psychology and whatnot. So people, people can adopt different personalities and different philosophies, I think certain philosophies are extensions of people's personalities. So I guess my, my question for you is, what is your relationship to pragmatism personally? Um, you know, I, mm -hmm. I know you've had a, a, a very powerful story that um, I heard on, on Scott's podcast, but just broadly speaking, what is your relationship to the philosophy that you espouse? Yeah, it's a good, good, good a really good question. I mean, I'm going to say two things before I launch into an answer. First is, sure. What you just said is very similar to what James says about temperaments, philosophical temperaments, that um, that we as individuals um, are attracted to certain ideas because certain ideas um, play a unique role in our lives, and that will vary depending on people. Right. So that's one one thought. The second thought is. Um, before I go forward, I just want to say that philosophy can only take you can only take you so far. So like there's there's I always thought prior to this, prior to my prior to the last two or three years, I thought philosophy and writing buttressed life. In other words, you lived out your philosophy. And there's something to that. And I think that that's right to some extent. But I also think that there's a type of arrogance that goes, and I'm not, I'm not suggesting you were putting there, but I think that there's a certain arrogance in thinking that we can map our lives to our philosophies in a sort of very, in an incredibly tight way. Right. Um, life exceeds thought, I think. But anyway, or, <laughs> anyway so is, the question is, what sort of relationship do I have to philosophy? Um, or these philosophies that we've yeah. been talking about. Um, I think that the, I've been through um, two divorces, three cardiac uh, event, you know, three heart attacks, a cardiac arrest, bypass surgery, sepsis, Lyme, C. diff, uh, like yeah, a lot the in the last, uh, yeah. in the last 10 years. Sure. And what I will say is that, um, Pragmatists, particularly William James, existentialists, particularly Friedrich Nietzsche, um, and transcendentalists, Margaret Fuller and Emerson and Thoreau, have repeatedly been sort of lifelines for me at different points and for different reasons. And um, you can say, like, tell, maybe you'd say, tell, tell me about them. Okay. So, um, the first idea that I put forward is that philosophy provides a type of companion in misery for you when you're going through the shit of life. Mm. And because um, philosophy is not born of, you know, leisure always, really good philosophy, I think, is oftentimes born of struggle and hardship and anxiety and depression, loneliness. Right. Etc. And um, you have the chance to hear someone else going through things in a thoughtful manner. And just that companionship can be instructive. Now, what philosophers say when they go through that stuff is also pretty darn instructive. So, Frederick Nietzsche's idea of the will to power and the amor fati. 
uh, those two have helped me through in many cases. I'll just give you the, the more fati, which is that you have to come to love your fate, right. it's the love of fate. And you have to come to love not only those moments that are most um, that are most triumphant in your life, but are also the most despicable, embarrassing, horrible, etc. Um, so too with um, you know Thoreau saying, "Tis healthy to be sick." Mm -hmm. uh, which is this idea that um, when you're sick, you learn a lot about yourself and you learn a lot about life and probably others going through similar, you know, alienating things. That's a weird way of phrasing it. But um, <laughs> so it, I think that, um, yeah, so it is, and I think James's comments about um, what makes life worth living, that it's about, um, that maybe life is worth living, that it's up to you, it depends on the liver, has gotten me through many a dark night. Um, and um, Emerson saying up again, old heart, even after his 21 year old um, wife had, has passed away from mm -hmm. tuberculosis, up again, old heart, and, and then giving reasons why it's possible. All of the, uh, I mean, all of those uh, things have resonated with me over the years and i'm happy to go into more philosophical detail on any of them basically but sure also. well I, I mean i get like so i i definitely the um you know philosoph philosophy is a companion in your misery i definitely um i, I buy into that that's certainly been my experience i guess um you know because william james was a psychologist right so i would imagine you know his philosophy is characterized to a great degree by his experiences as a psychologist versus, you know, someone else who, a Foucault who, who was not that or, uh, or, uh, you know, any number of people who were not, you know, embedded in the, in the profession of psychology. But like, certainly for me, um, you know, uh, Carl Jung, I, I would go back and read passages. Um, for example, you know, I, I was, I was going through some, uh, emotional trouble with a girl I was interested in, um, who it wasn't, didn't, um, uh, didn't reciprocate. And I remember reading a passage from Jung. It said something like, you know, the anima can sustain any injury. You know, for a man who's under the age of 35, the anima can sustain any injury and, and recover. Which is essentially the idea that, like, if you're under the age of 35, you can go through any heartbreak and, and you know, recover. And that's kind of Jung's axiom. And I just remember reading that and laughing, you know, and kind of like, you know, there's, there's an there's a encouraging aspect of that. Um, but I, I guess... Um, well, I, 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 I'd be curious to hear more, you know, sure. about your, your personal story, or we can move into, I definitely want to ask about the philosophical temperaments a little bit more, because I think that's um, some rich ground. Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll, I'll say a couple more things. I mean, the the relationship between James and Jung is an interesting one. When, James, when Jung and Freud came over to Clark University um, to give, you know, a series of talks, and James met them there, um, Freud was the big, you know, Freud was the the heavy hitter. Sure. Right. And, um, and Jung and James just spent the entire evening just talking to each other. Oh, wow. That's cool. And, um, and they didn't really pay attention. I mean, they didn't really pay very much mind to Freud. Sure. And, um, and what's interesting, I think, is that both James and Jung have a very deep belief in the unseen order. Mm. And, um, that we have to adjust our eyes to this unseen order in order to make life worth living. And I think that's really a power, it, for me it was is a very powerful um, idea because um, both of them seem to suggest that we live most of our lives blinkered, uh, that we don't see the world as it is, um, and that we structure our lives in such a way that we put blinders on and see only a very narrow angle of vision and that life is much richer and stranger and more powerful and more meaningful than we often give it credit for and this you could say oh is this just a uh, ghost you know james's ghost you know belief belief in ghosts <laughs> yeah, yeah, but no it's, it's it's the belief in something beyond our petty uh physical Purely um, materialist. Pure, purely materialist lives. Right. And that's a, I think that's a really important message for our day and age and for me. Um, 
or it was at many points in my life very important to me to realize that life might look a certain way right now, but it, it takes only a slight shift of perspective to see it in a different way. Sure. And, um, and, and so anyway, that, that, that's one comment I'd make. I, I'd also say, I'd also um, like to say that when it comes to James's, um, James asked the question in 1894, he says, is life worth living? And he says, maybe it depends on the liver, which I always thought was a complete cop out. <laughs> until I realized what James is doing is returning us to the question in an in a authentic way. He's saying it's up to us to make life worth living. Each one of us has choices. Each one of us, when he says it's up to the liver, he, he's playing with that word liver, but he's um, one way of reading it is, um, you know, it's up to you to make life worth living for yourself and for others. It's up to you. And the other way of reading it is something like, it, it does depend on your circumstance. The liver is this like organ of destiny or something right, right, right. In, for the ancients. Yes. And it's like, it's, it's kind of like, well, it depends on what lot in life you've been given. Sure. And, and James wants to say that each of those is equally true. Okay. And that's, and that's powerful and interesting. I think um, he's also, he also says something in that lecture which is entitled "Is Life Worth Living." He says, "Think about how much of our lives are meaningful because we explore the maybes of life. Like maybe this partner is going to love me or not. Maybe I'm going to win the soccer game or not. Maybe at this this chord that I play in this musical performance will be the right one." Mm -hmm. And then those possibilities is what keeps life on the move sure. and what, and what we explore both at our own risk, but at our own reward. Right. And so, I mean, I, I buy that. I, I buy that. Yes. Yeah. Because well, the, you know, um, to put it in Petersonian terms, chaos is the domain of both, you know, hell and, and reward. It's like, you have to go into the places where there's darkness to extract the potential reward. And you could just sit at home all day in the comfort of your own room, but then, you know, what's it? Yeah. Going I guess, Jordan Peterson, I'm too worried, and I could be wrong, but I'm too worried about the, I'm too worried about the idea that he, he really wants sort of like rapt attention, applause at the end, and, you know, si silence. Sure. I, and he wants to, he wants to crush his opponents. And so, for example, like, Peterson crushes feminism. The, the whole point sure. of a philosophical discussion should not, never be yes. to crush your opponent. No, I, I understand that. Lobster 